group meeting, and uh, Dr. Sturman is really one of the thought leaders in this disease and really has helped me to sort of clarify my mind some of the directions that we need to lead in. So, Dan, thank you very much for uh, your help. So, you're both pulmonologists, am I correct? Yes. Okay, so we have two pulmonologists who have really, um, you almost model more of what we see in the UK where we have the pulmonary specialists leading a lot of the malignancies. And here you, you really play a very key role in mesothelioma and very, a very unique role. Um, we don't usually have a pulmonologist so involved with the medical aspects of a, of a, of a malignancy. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, in terms of clinical trials, um, you, you know, you, you're both involved in clinical trials. Tobias, what is your interest in clinical trials? Where, where is your focus today? So uh, my f background is obviously, like Mary said, I'm a pulmonary physician. Uh, I'm also interested in immunology, and so my uh, interest is really uh, cancer immunotherapy and viral, viral therapy of malignancies using oncolytic viruses. And the clinical trial that I'm currently involved with actually uses the Mises virus, which was mentioned in one of the previous presentations as an oncolytic virus and we are administering, administering this virus directly into the pleural space using a Purex catheter with the hope that the virus will potentially directly kill uh, tumor cells by recognizing them more uh, better than, than the surrounding normal cells and that the virus might also function as a vaccine triggering an anti-tumor immune response as an additional effect. Uh, here and our study is currently a phase one study, which is fairly early in its development, and uh, uh, that's uh, what my clinical trial involvement is at this time. Uh, certainly, as Mary pointed out, as pulmonologists, we are typically more involved at the beginning of the disease, specifically diagnosing the disease, staging the disease. But uh, from my perspective, I think it's also important that we follow through and are involved in the therapeutics of the disease. So I come from a very similar background as Tobias. Uh, my background is a, as a pulmonologist. Uh, I also uh, am one of the pioneers in a new, relatively new field called interventional pulmonology, which is new here in the United States and involves, it's kind of a hybrid between some aspects of thoracic surgery and pulmonary medicine in which we use uh, scopes in the air passages and in the chest cavity to diagnose and treat uh, chest cancers and other diseases. And my interest is in combining some of the things that Tobias said, which is the ability to deliver uh, novel treatments, often which involve stimulating the body's immune system to fight cancer, and then using some of these other instrument-based techniques, the scopes into the lungs and into the chest cavity, to the pleural space, to both deliver and monitor the benefits of therapy. So. Um, I'm a plumber, but I'm a plumber that is an interest in what's going on inside the plumbing. And uh, my, my goal is that we work together as a team. I think that the, the answers to mesothelioma are not gonna come from one discipline. It's not gonna be just from surgery or just from radiation therapy, just from medical oncology. So I think that pulmonologists are used to working as part of a team. We often have to take a team approach to diagnosing patients and managing them, and so that we fit in very well to the team that's going to manage patients with mesothelioma both in the fact that we can help with the diagnosis and the staging of the disease, as well as helping in guiding the best therapies. And it's always good, I think, to have a pulmonologist on board if you're discussing, for example, surgery or radiation therapy, because underlying lung function is gonna have a great impact upon whether or not a patient's going to be a candidate for an intervention. Uh, a patient may be a, a, a perfect candidate for surgery, but may not be someone who could survive the surgery from a lung function perspective. So I think our general pulmonary skills do come in handy, even though we're very interested in the scientific side. So, um, Tobias, I wonder if you could just, um, just the basics. Uh, after an extra plumal, uh, pleural luminectomy, how does a patient breathe? Could you sort of explain, you know, how the other lung will take over and, and sort of some of the changes of, you know, what are patients to expect following that type of a surgery? Uh, yeah, the extra pleural is obviously a very uh, invasive surgery. As uh, you've heard in some of the previous presentations, during an extra pleural uh, the lung as well as the pleural surfaces are pretty much excised and in an end block procedure. So they all come out as one piece, so to speak. And uh, what that pretty much does is not only does it mean a lot of 
trauma to the patient. So it's a big surgery that causes quite a bit of tissue inju injury and, and results and in, in, uh, has to require a lot of healing afterwards. You also pretty much lose 50% of your lung function in, in, in this context. And it's also important to know that as we all go through life, we acquire lung diseases that affect our lungs. And so if I say 50% of your lung function, you're basically left with the other half of your, your lung, and that may be affected by a different disease. For instance, uh, some patients smoked during their use, and they may, may have COPD or emphysema, which may affect the other lung. So it may not be exactly 50% of the ideal lung function. So it really drops your lung function quite a bit and causes, in, in that context, your functional status to, to potentially deteriorate. And in some situations, patients to, to be left with a functional status that would be very difficult to maintain their quality of life and potentially require oxygen. And obviously, that's one of the things that we try to avoid by selecting patients appropriately when, they, when we decide what surgical procedure they, they are subjected to, that we actually really try to preserve quality of life as, as best as possible and preserve lung function as much as possible with these surgical procedures and try to do this in a proactive fashion where we actually try to select the right candidates for the right surgical procedure up front because uh, in contrast to extra pleurotomy, pleurectomy and decortication, the competing surgical strategy is designed to preserve the lung and therefore patients actually typically end up with more lung function at the end of the procedure. But I think it's important to recognize that it's a, it's, it is a dramatic change. Uh, that being said, typically, if you have healthy lungs, one lung actually can provide pretty good function for a patient. Uh, as is actually uh, ex an example for that is that when we perform lung transplantations in patients with end-stage lung disease, we actually uh, frequently only transplant one lung, and patients can gain uh, decent lung function after a single lung transplant. Uh, Dr. Sturman, uh, following an extra pleural pneumonectomy, if you develop a pleural effusion, um, how safe <coughs> is it to uh, insert a pleurex catheter for draining those infusions at home? Are you talking about on the side where uh, the pneumonectomy was done? No, or the I'm talking about the contralateral side? side when the disease I think returns. it's very safe. I mean, we, you have to use ultrasound to guide those procedures. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you're using ultrasound guidance mm -hmm. uh, and the person who's doing the procedure knows what they're doing, it should not be a problem. Okay. I mean, the biggest concern from my perspective is that when you have a pleural effusion on the side of your remaining lung, that it's a harbinger that the disease has now recurred in the site where you only have one lung remaining, and it's a bad prognostic sign, unfortunately. So I think we can do procedures, but from a, a prognostic perspective, I think we have to be honest with ourselves about what it means to have that pleural effusion on that side. If, if it turns out to be positive, for example, for tumor cells. And now, uh, how do you manage, um, uh, what, what is the rate of infections in, uh, when, once you've inserted a pleurex catheter? I believe it's pretty low, am I correct? It's 5% uh, or less right. mm -hmm. in general, and most of them can be managed by a course of oral antibiotics, leaving the catheter in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Radiation-induced pneumonitis, uh, we hear about that a lot. Could you explain a little bit about what it is and then how is it managed? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, so radiation pneumonitis is, is pretty much an inflammatory response that's caused by the ionizing radiation uh, exposure uh, of the lung. Uh, we uh, really manage... You're aware that you've been diagnosed with mesothelioma? Oh yeah, six different doctors. Okay. I had calcified asbestos, asbestos in the lower three inches of my lung, left lung. Well, it come in 50 pound bags if I remember. And uh, with a centrifugal pump pulling it, and our centrifugal pumps pulling them, 
and and you would take and tear those sacks open or cut those sacks open and pour it in that hopper. When you would open the bags, um, tell me what the material um, on the asbestos. Tell me what the material looked like. Powdery. Right. And when you dumped the bags, uh, what was that like? It was powdery and dust flying everywhere, and you throwed the bag over here in a pile. What did the air around you look like when you poured the asbestos? Bis when you was mix mixing a lot of it up, it was dusty, and and it would get all over you, and you certainly had to take a bath before you left the location. Okay. Um, did you have any respiratory equipment or protection? Never even thought about it. Okay. Did anybody tell you um, that you needed to do it when you were handling that filter? Julie. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I just have a, a request as a GCA parent. Um, as you are aware, um, GCA is um, in a building right now that is rather old and has several challenges. It's had a lot of plumbing issues, which Mr. Dangerfield has been wonderful uh, talking to me and, and working those problems out. Um, there's a large disproportionate amount of electricity that the facility uses because it is an old building. And the most recent problem has been the discovery of asbestos in some of the classrooms over the Christmas break, which is going to be um, removed and cleaned up um, over spring break. And Dr. Allison has been great in sending out a letter to the parents and communicating that. Um, however, there are still a lot of questions and concerns that parents in the community have. Um, therefore, I'm requesting if Dr. Allison and the board could please schedule a meeting and meet with the parents at GCA, um, hopefully prior to spring break, and maybe address some of these concerns that are um, in the very near future and long term as far as um, moving the facilities and, and when that may be that maybe we could move into a larger school um, and I, I would like to request if at all possible to please have <clears throat> GCA move to a larger campus by school year 2013-14 if at all possible but again I'm, I'm, I would really am requesting respectfully if we could please have a meeting with the parent community at the school to address some of these concerns. Thank you. I think Dr. Allison has a comment about that. Just uh, very quickly and it's uh, very uh, timely. Uh, today I met with the uh, with representatives of the, the president and uh, I believe another executive officer of the PTSO at uh, GCA, I went over there, went with the, them and we, with the with Jody Dean, the principal. And at that time, I provided some uh, some detail in regards to the questions that was the rest tonight. And at that time, I, I I volunteered myself to come to a parent meeting that they're there that the PTSO were going to be calling, and they said that they would prefer to. First of all, have a meeting without myself there and provide the information that I provided them today in regards to the issues that were raised. And then, if, if need be, then I would, would be called back af after spring break for a meeting with them.
Eternit uh, problem represents uh, an issue which is only getting started. It's an ecological bomb uh, which is uh, still ticking in other parts of the world where uh, we see uh, where it, they've used uh, Eternit plates uh, on the wall of uh, a 